a reading from Job. Now when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. The word of the Lord. This week's question is, what do you need? There's no question that we all have needs and that our needs are different. One of the popular songs Canadian Anne Murray used to sing was, You Needed Me. And one of Kenny Rogers' number one hits was, I Don't Need You. Our needs are our own unique needs, especially in the hard times of life. This morning's Bible verses are from the book of Job, a man with extreme needs. When his story begins, he is not needy. He has seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and many servants. But in the story, Satan wanted to prove to God that the only reason Job loved God was because, but was because God had blessed him. And so Satan went out and one terrible day wiped out everything that Job had, all of his animals, all of his servants, all of his 10 children. But the text says in all of this, Job did not sin or accuse God of doing wrong. And so Satan inflicted Job with sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. That medical condition now called the Job syndrome is known to be an immunodeficiency and still Job would not curse God. Job had three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Tamathite. Scholars do not know the names of their uh, scholars do not know the significance of their names or of where they were from. When the three friends heard about all of Job's troubles, each of them set out from his home and they met together to go and console and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and they wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. That ancient practice of tearing one's clothes is called kriya and is still done in Orthodox Jewish funeral services today. In Reformed Jewish services, a black ribbon is pinned on one's clothes and the ribbon is torn. And the grieving family wears the torn garments or ribbons for the next seven days as they sit Shiva. Shiva, the Hebrew word for seven. And during that week, family and friends visit to give their condolences and to provide comfort, a practice more than 2,000 years old. Job's friends sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and none of the three friends spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great, but then then they began to speak, and for the next 25 chapters, they tried to convince Job that the bad things which had happened to him happened because he had sinned, but they were wrong. They were like people now who go to grieving people to explain their suffering by saying, everything that happens is God's will. Don't ever say that. You don't know if the tragedy was God's will and even if it were, to tell a grieving person that would never help. When I was a pediatric neurosurgeon, I sometimes overheard a relative trying to comfort a grieving parent by saying, God just needed another angel. And once I overheard someone say, at least you have another daughter. 
Don't ever try to explain. One thing grieving people do not need is an answer to the why question. Why did this happen to me? Sometimes the answer to the why question is obvious. The man was drunk and fell asleep at the wheel and drove head on into the car of teenagers coming home from the prom. But most of the time, life happens and there's no answer to the why question. Does it really help to learn that Dylan Roof murdered the nine Christians during a prayer service in Charleston because his parents taught him to hate African Americans? No. Would it help you to be told that you develop breast cancer because you inherited the BRCA1 gene that increased your risk of cancer by 80%? No. An answer to the why questions is rarely what grieving, suffering people need. What do we need? At least four things. Professor Katie Billman taught our seminary class on care for the bereaved and dying as her husband was, her husband of many years, was dying of metastatic cancer. And a few months after he died, I asked Katie, what do grieving people really need? And her first answer surprised me. She said, we need to grieve, to mourn, to lament the pain of our loss as people have lamented for centuries. There are more psalms of lament than psalms of praise or thanksgiving. And most of the psalms of lament end with some word of hope, but Psalm 88 does not. And there are times in our grieving when we feel as if there is no hope. We need to grieve, to not suppress our sorrow. Secondly, we need for others to not avoid us because we are grieving, but to be willing to, to just be with us, not to try to say something helpful, but to listen if we want to talk, or to just sit in silence with us if we don't want to talk. After the son of Yale philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff died, people asked him, what, you, what should you say to someone who is suffering? And he said, your words don't have to be wise. The heart that speaks is heard more than the words spoken. The heart that speaks is heard more than the words spoken. And if you can't think of anything to say, just say, I can't think of anything to say, but I, I want you to know I am with you in your grief. Walter Storff said, what I really need is to hear that you are with me. It's called the ministry of presence. Thirdly, we need to know that God is with us in our grief. In the 23rd Psalm, we hear, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. In the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel, an angel told Joseph that Mary would bear a son to be named Jesus, who would be Emmanuel, God with us. And in the last chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' last words to his disciples were, and remember, I am with you always. If we are honest, we hear verses like that and we may say, so what, I hurt just as bad. William Sloan Coffin said, the words of the Bible are true, but grief renders them unreal. When we grieve, we need to hold tightly to Paul's words in Romans 8. I am convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing, not death and not grief. And the fourth thing we need is hope. There's a famous verse in Jeremiah chapter 29 which says, 
for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Do you remember the verses Jesus told his disciples about how he would give them hope? No, you don't, because Jesus said nothing about giving his followers hope, not in any of the four Gospels. Why didn't he? Because of something else he said, I am with you always. And if that is true, that is why we have hope today and in all the days to come, whatever may come. Job's story raises the same questions about us that it raised for Job. Is God still our God if we lose our possessions? our family, our health? Or is God only our God if God blesses us with health and prosperity? When our lives are broken by whatever cause, God wants us to trust the truth of something Job did not know, that God is with us in our suffering. When life happens, there is nothing we need more. During the music for reflection, or later today, would you ponder the question, what do I need? What do I really need? And write down your thoughts. Maybe share them with God. <clears throat> Maybe share them with God in prayer, or with someone you live with, or with a dear friend, or with a pastor. We are all in this together. Amen.